you so much. Okay. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call your attention. I'm sorry. I know the audio is a bit muffled. Please, uh, we're asking everyone to take your seats. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Hello, everybody. Please take their seats. We're, we're, we'd like to go ahead and get started now. It's 10 a.m. Hello. Sorry. I'm hoping that we can, um, hopefully the tables in the back can hear as best. I know that it sounds a bit muffly, but um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Si hay alguien aquí que habla español, necesita servicios de traducción, les voy a pedir que vengan a mesa número uno que está aquí, enfrente. Um, vamos a tener aquí uh, servicios de traducción uh, en español. So we want to just make sure that if everyone is here, has registered up front at the registration table, and you've also grabbed a folder, which I'm going to go over right now. This is Audie. I work for Contra Costa County Behavioral Health Services in the MHSA, Mental Health Services Act office, and we're here today for the Early Childhood Mental Health Community Forum. Um, I'd like to spend some moments to go over the folder that you received upon registration. So we have the agenda here, um, pretty basic, kind of covers what we're going to go over today, as well as some guidelines, which will be covered later uh, for just participating in today's forum. We have your input and evaluation forms, which are this blue piece of paper in your folder. We're going to ask everyone um, before the end of today to please fill this out. We really would like for you to fill out both sides. Um, if you really don't have any input to offer, please uh, at least fill out the evaluation side and return this today. You can return it on your way out, leave it at the registration table, or leave it at the table where you're sitting. Just make sure that uh, it stays here so that we can get that information back. We also have a calendar for November, which are various community meetings that we hold. Um, there's date times as well as a location for most of them. And if you're interested in a meeting and it doesn't have the information, you can connect with us after. Um, there's also the CPA brochure here that has um, more information on each one of those specific committees and meetings. So it gives you a bit of a description on what these work groups are. They're open to the community. We welcome public participation and community participation. Some of the various groups that we have that meet our Suicide Prevention Community Forum, a child, a children, teens, and young adult um, committee. We also have our Systems of Care Committee, and all these various committees meet to discuss various um, programs, things that are going on within our public mental health system. Um, they're also a way that we can receive input and have community involvement as well. We also have this um, and center here. It's a list of uh, various resources for mental health. Um, it's kind of organized in a way where we have children's services in the front and then adult services towards the second half. And it's for East Contra Costa County, but really it's all of the county. What we do is we'll organize with um, the region that we're at. Right now we're in East Contra Costa, so it'll have all of the East Contra Costa resources listed first, and then it'll have general county resources towards the back. Um, we also have these dots here in your folder. There's five green dots. Most of you should have um, them. If you don't have them, please let us know. Please hold on to these. At the end of the forum, we will be doing a voting of service needs, which uh, there are needs that we've identified during this um, three-year process that the community has voiced, and they're actually out here in this hallway up on the walls. So before you leave at the end of the forum, we, were, we will ask that you use these five dots and place them up on areas that you feel are important and you can use them in any way you'd like. You can put all five in one, you can put three in one, two in another, um, however you'd like to do it, but we do want you to vote because that is um, part of our process to uh, verify different or gauge different service needs within our county 
um, as well as your input that's received through the small group discussions that will happen later and the input and evaluation forms. Last, we have the um, PowerPoint that's up here today. You'll have all that information in here, so you can go through it with us, as well as the um, PowerPoints that will be offered by the other agencies that are here to speak later. Um, I do think it's helpful if you if you run through it. I know that there's a bit of a glare from the sunlight on that side, so if it's easier for you to look at your documents and versus a screen, please um, go forward. If uh, there's any other questions before we move along, I'm going to pass this over now to Amanda. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, for this community forum. Um, I wanted to um, go ahead and let folks know about um, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one is that uh, you are certainly welcome throughout um, the event to um, help yourself to refreshments, which are available on both sides um, of the room. Um, so please feel free to get up at any time to get more coffee or snacks. Um, we've also um, got restrooms. If you go back out the door that you came in through, um, you'll be able to um, take a quick left and go down the hall, and it'll be on your right-hand side. Um, um, we also wanted to make sure everyone was aware of uh, have our, our hashtag and the social media opportunity. So throughout the forum today, um, if you'd like to uh, post anything about what you're hearing, what you're learning, what you're excited about, we've got this hashtag early childhood forum. So we invite you to uh, participate in that space. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Suzanne Tabato, who's the Director of Behavioral Health Services, to share a few words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Hey, Jean. Um, so at work of putting together our next three-year plan for the Mental Health Services Act. So just a couple of um, introductory sort of comments. How many of you, this is a rather, I'm not being ageist, but a rather young group in here. So I'm wondering how many of you were around when we did all of the lobbying of, of what got us here today. So um, Proposition 64 really came up as a grassroots effort, and it really took um, what I just said. I'm sorry, Prop 63. Oh, I sh that, was, that was not a good um, one to mix up, but Prop 63. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but it really took a lot of work from the community to get that proposition moved forward on the ballot. Um, and many people in Contra Costa County literally were at the BART stations um, talking to people out on the streets. They were going door to door leafleting. It was a very, very important initiative and people of the community took it very seriously and really worked to make it happen. So Prop 63, in fact, was a ballot measure. It did pass. That's the 1% um, tax on people making more than a million dollars. And um, since 2004, a lot has been going on. What I would want to highlight is that the Mental Health Services Act really allowed us to do a number of things. One, really expand and build out our sort of traditional Medi-Cal services. But as importantly, sometimes more importantly, all of the kinds of services that we knew the community needed, but Medi-Cal didn't cover. And um, along with that, as many people know, Medi-Cal is built on an illness model. And we were really trying to move away from that. And the Mental Health Services Act really is what propelled all of our thinking forward about wellness, recovery, resiliency, client and family centered, culturally appropriate, et cetera. So it was very key in terms of a lot of policy areas in addition to the money, but the money was very important. So um, one of the components, the, the authors of the act gave this a lot of thought and what Medi-Cal never allowed us to do was very much prevention and early intervention, although we all knew that that was so important. So when the act was written and passed, it really called out prevention early intervention as one of the key components of the act and put a lot of protections around it. And as you all know, 
that um, there were requirements that really the majority of the PEI funds be spent on youth and really to get early interventions for kids. So that's sort of the history that um, got us to this point. And um, is anybody from um, People Who Care, anybody here? I'm, I'm gonna take a little bit of liberty and I'm gonna, there have been so many fine services and programs um, that have come about because of the Services Act and many of you in here represent those programs. But there's one that I'm gonna sort of highlight and I'm gonna take a little liberty because they're not here and Veronica's not here. But I bring it up because it was one of our first PEI initiatives and it also got us into a little bit of trouble. And so I particularly like it for those reasons. The little bit of trouble it got us into was at some point the media got onto how the Mental Health Services Act funding wasn't being well spent and they listed different PEI programs up and down the state and they included the hip hop car wash and they just didn't get it. And um, so I wanna bring it up for a number of reasons in addition to what I just said. So Veronica Pope is a resident of Pittsburgh. She was very dedicated, is very dedicated to this community. She worked in a variety of children's programs around the Bay Area, but this was her home. And she knew the youth of this community. She knew their vulnerabilities. She really wanted to work to help them move forward in their lives. And so she put forward one of the first PEI proposals, and that was the hip hop car wash. And to me, the hip hop car wash says a lot of things. For one, the idea came from this community by a community member based on knowing the members of this community. And that is really important because really the community knows best what it needs that makes sense to kids and engaging the kids. So that was very important. And then the other really important component that came through, and I think that Veronica in many ways put this forward, is that it's our responsibility to look for the strengths in every child because every child has strengths. And once you identify those strengths, you can start building on them and building resiliency. And in the end, my feeling, I think you all share this with me, is that resilient youth build resilient communities. So that's what we're here to do today is pick your brains about what, how can we best serve our different communities best serve the, the youth of our committee, our communities, starting from really um, zero on up, um, because that's where we have to start. I started my career in public health nursing in upstate New York, and my job was to go into the homes of new moms who were experiencing different emotional, psychological, and be supported and healthy is really one of the first steps in then promoting that in, in their children. So I'm going to stop there. I'm really so excited about this, so happy to have all of you. And I would like to introduce the member of the Board of Supervisors who represents this region, and that's Supervisor Federal Glover. So thank you. To sleep in a little bit. But uh, it's, it's great to be out here today and to see so many of you who have come out to really uh, sit down and plan and strategize on how we deliver services within our various communities. We know that this is very important because the earlier that we can reach our young people in providing them with the service and need, needs that they have, the better off our community they continue to do in collaborations with all of our community-based organizations that are service providers because it's so important early on that they don't take them into as they, the more formative years as they grow. As you know, our young people are able to live um, in healthy ways of growing is in place. So this forum is to our communities and work with our providers that are out there um, because when we build communities and you, you all that are here today are so important in building those communities and making sure that we have healthy communities, healthy children, um, that grows up into a healthy adulthood. So once again, when we think about what has taken place in Contra Costa, most of California, we need to make sure that the services that we need are in place. So once again, I wanna thank you for being here today. 
your active participation in our planning process is so important, and we need to capture what those needs are in terms of services that are going to be valuable and, once again, help our young folks grow healthy and our communities grow strong. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, we're going to give you a little bit of an orientation to um, MHSA, and we're so happy to have um, Jennifer Brueggemann um, with um, MHSA Prevention and Early Intervention to tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, good morning everyone. Um, let's see. Okay, I think actually that Dr. Tavano has given a much more eloquent history of MHSA than I could <laughs> possibly do here, but um, I'll try to just uh, give us a little bit more background. Um, so the Mental Health Services Act, also known as Prop 63, was passed uh, by California voters in November 2004. This is basically a millionaire's tax, so people in our state making over a million dollars um, pay into this. and. The point is to really kind of create additional funding to expand and transform the existing public mental health system. Um, so we have what we consider the core values of MHSA, and that is that services are to be consumer and family driven, uh, based in the community. They should be culturally responsive, um, integrated with other services, and most importantly, focused on wellness, recovery, and resiliency. Um, so MHSA also requires that we do a three-year program and expenditure plan, and I'll just say a little bit more about that. Okay, so currently we're in our um, 2017 to 20 plan, so we're kind of at the tail end of it. This is something that actually gets approved by the Board of Supervisors and updated annually. Um, it is, let's see, show you. It's a big document like this. It includes all the MHSA funded services and the um, funding that's set aside to pay for those services. Okay. Um, these plans are really, a big part of it is this process. We call it the community program planning process. Your input is very important to us. Um, so we really appreciate you being here today. At this point, we're at the end of our three year cycle. So we've had, I think this is actually a little bit um, old, but we've had nearly a thousand people participate in these types of forums. We've done different themes throughout the years, um, and we do about three of these per year. So, this just gives you a little bit of information about how the funding is broken down into the different components. So MHSA sets aside about $54 million that supports over 80 programs throughout the county. Uh, the first component is community supports and services, and that's designed to support children and adults of all ages that are living with a serious mental illness. The majority of this is spent on full service partnerships, or FSPs, and that is, um, for those who aren't familiar, just intensive case management programs that kind of have a um, whatever it takes approach. Second category is prevention and early intervention. And um, this is really, as Dr. Tavano had mentioned, the majority of this funding is designed to be spent on young people ages zero to 25. Um, this is outreach, prevention, early intervention, um, stigma and discrimination reduction. Next we have innovation, and this is time-limited funding that um, is designed to stand up new and unique mental health programs, um, and it's kind of done through a competitive application process. Next one is workforce education and training. Um, some recent examples of how that's been utilized in this county was a loan repayment program, um, intern stipends, that kind of thing. And lastly, we have capital facilities and information technology. So this funding is used to renovate existing physical structures, and it's also recently been used to implement a new electronic health record for behavioral health. All right. And this slide just gives you an example of 
some of the programs that are funded by MHSA in our county. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Amanda. Great, thank you so much for that orientation and helping us understand a little bit more about the program. Um, so we wanted to just orient everyone to what we're looking for from all of you as participants in today's forum. Um, so um, I did wanna just highlight on the back of the agenda, we have some guidelines for forum participants. We're hoping to get from everybody today is participating in this forum, reviewing all of the great information in your, in your folders and filling out um, any of those uh, feedback forms or other opportunities to um, weigh in and definitely ask questions along the way. Uh, we also really are hoping for strong participation in the breakout sessions. Um, and discussing public mental health needs and topics at hand, um, and prioritize mental health issues and prioritize service needs that are important to you and the community. Um, so if you hear that you're, you're specific that, um, we're so happy uh, to have with us today Sean Casey, um, who's the executive director of First Five. Yes. Yes. It's great to see you all here, and I am, whenever I do some of our work on Saturdays, I am always amazed a lot about your commitment to your community and your support for families and children, and I hope it means that you're here because you actually want to do more for your communities and your families and your children, because otherwise I don't know why you would be here on a Saturday. Folks have been to our new First Five Center over on Leland. Anybody seen that? Okay, a few of you. I encourage you to go over and see that. It's absolutely beautiful. And hone their skills because you need them if you're going to raise children, as you know. It's not like you're born with the instructions. So um, it's a great place to go. Um, how many, do we have any child care providers in the room? Maybe you might feel like you're overtrained by this point, but some well-trained experts on early development and supporting children and families in the room as well. And I thank you because your work is really important. Uh, the child care providers often uh, are with them as professionals, um, the better off we will all be. Um, I wanted to say just a couple things before we get going with our main event speaker um, to talk about why early childhood and what this all means. So um, as our folks in behavioral health have been telling you, this is part of, of, of a broader scheme. But why early childhood mental health? Why early childhood? And the main reason is early childhood is different. It just is. Um, and the reason for that is it is the time, it is a unique time to develop or change quicker than we do in the first five years of life. 90% of brain development occurs in the first five years. So, 526, yes. There's always somebody in the room says, I hope it's 50, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but 90% of it is occurring in the first five years. Now think about that. I think they can sit up when they can crawl, when they can walk. But there's also all this other activity going on in the brain. There are millions of <clears throat> neurons being developed every month. That's how much development there is. But a key aspect of that is not only all those motor skills and when they start smiling and talking, but health, what is that? I don't understand. Um, and I, I, the first time I heard that, I was mystified as a, to regulate their emotions, here that really isn't typical. And so your child care providers in the room are great observers of this. They're often the ones who will pick up and a child really has difficulty um, sitting still or being in one place. Or a child really has difficulty being with peers and is aggressive. Or there are other behaviors that come out this, and those actually help people um, before they uh, grow on and go into schools, and then they're dealing with behavior. About that healthy development, it depends on relationships. It's one of the miracles that I kind of see in my learning about early childhood over the years, relationships with adults. There's literally holding that baby, singing to that baby, soothing, 
relationship is actually the most important thing for healthy child development. And that's a wonderful thing. And the more of those who's really responsible for um, create, intervening and and help them get what they need at the First Five Center or at one of the many other agencies here in Bourne in Contra Costa now. Uh, there are more and more, the rate is going up, being a kid here. If you're commuting, if you've got both parents working, it just, you know, it's hard. So how comes out of today is we all are thinking about how do we create those healthy communities that support those. So I'm really glad you all are here. <clears throat> um, and I know that we're going to have some great ideas. And helping frame up why we're talking about this important topic. Um, we're so excited to have with us methods to support mental health in early childhood. Jen. It's most proximity to early childhood health, wellness, and healing. So whatever that means for you. I don't see a lot of zero to five-year-olds in the audience. But we're talking about their investments. So I just want to say that. I want to say that I've been, um, that I grew up in systems and I grew up in programs, but mostly I grew up in relationships and that now I'm still growing up. I believe I'm still growing up <laughs> as a service provider in systems and programs. And that, so I'm going to speak from my place where I had stories of incredible healing growing up in programs and services and systems. And I also had stories of harm. I had a community level and a system level and how to really heal in all of those areas. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about understanding and healing early childhood trauma. So I'm a uh, child therapist and I've never had a zero to five year old come to me or call me up on the phone and say, I think, you know, I'm really concerned about my aggressive behavior. I think, you know, I'm looking for some help with my post-traumatic stress disorder. I think it's an interesting thing that we do in systems when we say things like zero to five and when we separate children from families in their healing. And so I work with a lot of family members who tell me over and over and over again, Jen, please go tell those systems, go tell those systems. We experience trauma as families, and we need places to heal as families. So I just want to put that out there, too, um, that when we're talking about understanding and healing early childhood trauma, we're not talking about children separated from families, even though we know that that's some of the trauma happening in this country today. So I'm going to play a Sesame Street video. Um, and it talks about trauma from the child's perspective. So it's a little sad, trigger warning around intimate partner violence, growing up maybe exposed to that. So if anybody needs to step out of the room, um, totally okay, we're here to take care of ourselves and to show up and what the child's experience is like, but we're also thinking about what is healing from the child's experience in this video. Who is the person who soothes in this video? Yeah? Okay. Let's see if we could do this. Technical trauma. <laughs> so um, we may not be able to get this to work, and we're low on time. 
So it's a video from Sesame Street, and, and it looks, and you can find it online. It's public access. I'm so sorry that we couldn't play it today. Um, but what's that? We might be able to go to YouTube, or I could try to put my flash drive in. I don't, yeah? We could try real quick. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it might play better from the flash drive, but we'll see. Okay, so we're gonna see if we can practice resilience, which is bouncing back from adversity, so we couldn't get it to play. Um, you can go on YouTube and find it, Sesame Street, and it's um, trauma from the child's perspective. Um, but m what I most wanted folks to um, get from that video was that you know there's, there's a young daughter and a baby, and the parents are arguing in the background. You don't see the parents, but you hear the parents, right? But what you do see is the children starting to become scared, right? Getting scared because voices are being raised and you can feel the energy in the room. And the baby starts crying, and I think it's about a four-year-old or a five-year-old who's in the video. Some of you have seen it. Um, and so you can just sort of see them becoming fearful and stressed, right? And the baby's crying, and the older sibling goes to comfort the baby, and the voices get louder, the parents, and the stress is going up, and I'm starting to feel stressed now, just watching the video, right? Um, and then grandpa comes in. Grandpa comes in the door, and grandpa soothes and comforts the child. And grandpa is what we call the medicine or the buffer and so I want to say this, it can be controversial because there's a lot of programs here and I'm, an, I'm a program manager, right? But we know that children don't grow up in programs. They grow up in families and communities. And even when they grow up in, in foster care, they still grow up in families and communities and in relationships. So just holding that up. And children heal from trauma, not necessarily in programs or services, but in the relationships that are able to come about from those programs and services. So when we're thinking about the quality of programs, sometimes I want us to hold that we're thinking about the quality of the people in those programs and the relationships. So we know that stress is linked to the six leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents. Has everyone here heard about the ACEs study? Okay, I figured, right? So the adverse childhood experiences. We've know, we know a lot, trauma has been a buzzword, ACEs has been a buzzword. I wanna spend some time not so much focusing on what we know hurts families and children, but what we know actually heals and supports families and children. Um, we know that stress is linked to the six leading causes of death, that trauma impacts more than just the individual, that there's a ripple effect to others. Where are my child care providers in the audience? Like one child is impacted by trauma in your classroom, in your child care center, 
The whole group is impacted, trust me, right? Um, and communities, some communities are disproportionately affected. We know that the experience of oppression and racism is not just stress, but toxic stress built up over time or collective trauma. Yes. We know that also that plays out in system trauma, right? And hearing those kind of chronic doses of messages day in and day out, you don't belong here, you're not worthy, right? Um, those are traumas, we locate those as traumas. Um, so that that can be a really toxic brew. Racism, poverty, trauma, toxic brew. We also know from epigenetics that trauma and resilience can be encoded in DNA, right? And can be passed down through generations. And again, that so many families have said we went through this trauma together, whether it was a fire or a loss of housing or poverty. We went, through this fam we went through this trauma together, so why is the child going to child therapy and the parent going to parent therapy, right? And grandma's not invited or abuela's not invited to any of it. We need, to, we need, we need spaces that honor us as a family and that can support us healing together. And so we know that we are up against a lot. So many of us are up against a lot of stressors um, these days. And about systemic preventative approaches. And that includes all our different programs and systems and services, really understanding trauma and understanding what heals. So this can't be just a send this person to the best early childhood trauma therapist in Contra Costa County. This is about how do we all come together to create networks, sanctuaries, refuges, where children and families and whole communities can heal together. And that's what we mean by preventative approach. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about stress, which is different than trauma. How many people, raise your hand, have not felt any stress in the last week? <laughs> Three days, one day, oh, I got somebody in the back, okay, I want to talk to you, um, <laughs> right, so we're all up against stress, we all know stress, stress isn't always bad, so on this slide, if you can't see it, in the back we have performance up here, this axis, and then we have stress, stress arousal down here. And so what we know is that, this is called the Yerksey Dodson Law, what we know is that not all stress is bad. I, I was just really stressed out, just trying to get that video running, right? Um, you know, not all stress is bad. Stress got me here this morning, right? Stress hopefully got me here with enough energy so that I'm not putting you to sleep right now. And we have optimal stress zones. And when we think about performance, we're not just thinking about job performance. You can think about performance in your relationships. Think about performance as a parent, right? Sometimes we need optimal stress to perform well as parents or providers. So, and when we don't have enough stress, we're asleep. Or enough coffee for me. Um, so we wake up in the morning, we're sleepy, we don't have a lot of stress, maybe, maybe. Maybe you have all your stress in the morning, who knows what you're up against. You, it, it fosters alertness, there's an optimal zone. But then sometimes you get a phone call. You're in your optimal stress zone, you get a phone call. Let's say you get a phone call from, for the parents in the room, your child's school. The kids are really sick, we need you to pick them up right away. Then you get another phone call from, let's say, uh, your cousin who a uh, car broke down and is late for an appointment at work and is needing you to pick them up and give them a ride. Then you get an email from your boss saying they really need to talk to you right away, that there was something due the other day. Now you're starting to have those stressors begin to add up. And usually for most of us, we begin to experience a little bit of anxiety. 
we begin to have our heart beat a little bit faster. Our lungs may constrict, right? So that's the way in which stress affects our body, not just our brain development, but our body. Um, so anxiety, you know, when we are in the anxious state, we can begin to um, start to lose access to the wisdom and brilliance that we normally are able to walk around in with, right? Enough anxiety that doesn't get mitigated or metabolized can then become disorganization, right? And now I'm trying to do three different things at once, and I don't know where my keys are, and they're in my hand. <laughs> right? And I'm looking for my phone with the flashlight app on my phone. These are real stories. I hope I'm not alone. <laughs> usually, you know, I'm overeducated. So usually I have a good sense about me, but up against enough stress, we all become disorganized. Not just children, right? All of us. And that begins to affect our parenting. It begins to affect how we are as a child care provider. I would say it affects our ability to be in relationship with anyone, anytime, whether we are supervisors, providers, wives, husbands, partners, parents, peers, and trauma. And that can be said as parents or programs or systems. So then how do we think about this? So that example I just gave of the video, that's a challenge. You know, I, it was a stressor, but it was a challenge. It's not going to, like, you know, take me out, right? Um, I had resources. I had my people over here who were trying to fix it with me. They came to my aid. We couldn't fix it. It doesn't mean the world is over, right? Where we get into trouble is when we're, when we're up against stressors or challenges and they become threats and our body thinks of them as threats. And sometimes we think about this in terms of the stressors, right? So if we have enough, sometimes we think, well, we just need to get our stress down. More self-care, get my stress down, right? And I would argue that Sometimes, you know, we are not going to be able to create stress and trauma-free environments or communities. I'm going to float that out there. I know that sometimes I go to, um, I'm not, I not, don't mean to be cynical, but this isn't about creating stress and trauma-free places, but this is about changing the way we understand, mitigate, metabolize, and move through that stress and trauma in ways that we can be healing or going through the messy, rough, wounding, hard places. But from a place of threat into a place of challenge sometimes is really by focusing on the resources. But if we go back here to this slide here, when we're in threat mode, sometimes the easiest way to get us back to optimal is by looking at those resources. If we stay in threat too long, it has an impact on our development, our brain development, our bodies, our relational development. It has long-term adverse outcomes for our health, not just as individuals, but the community. So we're trying to avoid that. And here's a definition of trauma. There's many definitions of trauma. I like the root of the word trauma that comes from wound or injury, sometimes psychic injury. Um, but here's your medical definition. Individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced. So it's an event, and then there's the experience by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening to the child. And in this case, we're talking about early childhood. So it's not only to the child, but it might be like in the Sesame Street video that we never got to watch, the sibling. Right, the baby who was there. Um, so an event, the way it's experienced, and the effects. And so it can have lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So that's our definition. Early childhood trauma, prevalence, and what it looks like. So early childhood trauma can look many, many different ways. Here are some ways that it can look by age. 
So again, I've never had a zero to five come into my office or call me up and say, you know, they were experiencing traumatic stress symptoms and we're looking for help. Um, usually, it's about seeing the wound expressed in behavior. For preschool children, fear being separated, so a lot of fear response, right? A, a lot of what we say, they have a really hard time going to school, so that might be an indicator. Not wanting to be separated from, from the family, because I don't know what's going to happen to my family if I'm not with them, so that sort of fear could be an indicator. Um, crying and screaming a lot, aggressive behaviors. And what we like to say, we have a, um, there's a video also out there that's a great one by one of my mentors, Alicia Lieberman, talks about ghosts and angels in the nursery. And really looking at aggression in young children as just terror. If we can begin to see aggressive behaviors, it's too. <laughs> just saying. Right? Um, elementary school children, anxious, um, difficulty sleeping, right? So we have a therapeutic preschool in Oakland, California, and our most difficult time is transition to nap. <laughs> most of our relational medicine is given out during the transition to nap. And what a great, resilient thing about little kids is that they create that space for us to love on them during their transition to nap. So in some ways, little kids are really good about expressing what they need in the moment and allowing us opportunity to intervene. And then doing that in ways that heal rather than induce more stress. Like doing when you see cry if somebody hands you a crying baby, what do you do? There are always a few that run away. That's cool. <laughs> Hand it back. <laughs> and we can call it interpersonal neurobiology. But really, that rocking and hugging and touching and soothing, during that place, during that moment, those children are borrowing our calm, regulated inter intrabiology. Right, so that they can soothe themselves. So we say resilience is definitely relational. And that services towards healing, and that we want our parents and families to be able to be that calm, soothing medicine for kids who are wounded and struggling and hurting. And so sometimes it's about our relationships with caregivers. So the good thing from studying early childhood trauma is that we have a lot of information about what heals. And so what we know in addition to relationships is that the timing and quality of early experiences combine to shape brain architecture. And so we can heal and grow through relationships, through positive relationships. We have lots of early adversity. Um, was in our, I was thinking about this with the hip hop car wash, was in our block party. So I grew up in San Jose, and we had a block to take care of each other's kids. So we were latchkey kids, remember that? Latchkey kids at like second grade, right? That was where sometimes I was able to have some of my stories of healing and some of my own growth and brain architecture. And we know, who knows about the protective factors? I'm going to go through this really quickly. Okay, so protective factors, again, I'm going to locate the protective factors in what we know is healing and soothing and builds that relational. Actually, is an interesting, I'm not, I don't have time, I got, already got my minute sign about, you know, where this comes out of, but it comes out of families who went through a lot of family trauma, a lot of poverty, a lot of system involvement, and how they healed a study about what actually, what was it in your services, in your relationships, that allowed you to come back together and sustain. Because, you know, if you're a family and you've been in the welfare system, it is really hard to sustain coming back together, right? And so looking at what those drivers were, um, parental resilience, social connections, 
knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete supports in times of need, and social emotional, social emotional learning in young children. And so I'm just gonna lift these up because these aren't necessarily evidence-based models of therapy, right? These are things we all can do in the early childhood family field. And all of us, when we think about the services that we are funding, investing, prioritizing for our little ones and families, we need to know that this is what families tell us that they need in times of stress and trauma. These are the things that make the most difference for them. So how do we then invest in our programs and people to make sure that families are receiving this in ways that are loving and kind and affirming and are human, not dehumanizing, but really lifting up their humanness. <laughs> okay, we'll do one minute. So I want you to pair up with somebody next to you. We're gonna do a little relational, a relational medicine really quickly just to engage in this. Um, so you're gonna pair up with somebody and get beyond the title and who they're, which identity they're coming in with and think about, um, introduce yourself and share about a person or protective fa factor in your past that you experienced and how it impacted you and your loved ones. So this will be a pair share and we're gonna do it quick. So it's one minute per person and, right, quick dose, one minute per person and I'll tell you when to switch. And if you could start wrapping up. And we're gonna close out in a couple minutes. So if I can bring your attention back up here. And you can just raise your hand if you can see me, hear me, raise your hand. Thank you, thank you. Um, just a quick popcorn um, in your pair shares. Did anybody talk about your protective factor being a person that wasn't in your family? Yes, yes? who was yours? In the faith community. In the faith community, yes, pastors, faith community. Yeah. Miss, Miss People, the older lady that lived in our community. Mm-hmm, Miss, Miss People. Thank you. Yeah, the elder in the community that everybody knew. Anyone? Yes. The neighbor. Uh-huh. I got any coaches? I hear that a lot. Coaches. We do a lot of work with coaches. Teachers. Teachers. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, you can do this. I would encourage you to actually have conversations where you're lifting up the protective factors in your programs and services and with your families to better understand, like, what is it, what is the medicine that really helps them heal and grow? Because their, their wisdom, they own their wisdom, right? And so this is about us figuring out how to listen leave you with family support resources what does it look like um, so you're thinking about early childhood trauma development and growth and I'm going to offer you some um, as you think about the priorities and investments to really think about um, what does that look like in terms of the uh, protective factors and the buffers because like that challenge and threat slide we can't always do much to to take down the stressor sometimes right so we were working in new york city and they had just realized that um, the the preterm births were going up for some of their immigrant communities during the ice raids in new york city right so in unlike california because we're better i'm biased um you know they they they, they haven't legislated like we have um, but what they were able to do is to put up posters, right? So they couldn't change the stressor. They could not change the ice rates in the, in the boroughs that were near the hospitals. But they did put up posters in many different languages that talked about being sanctuary hospitals, right? So again, they looked at the resources, the buffers, the ways in which we can love, affirm, and create healing-centered interventions, knowing what people are up against every day, right? And so again, I, I just invite you to think about, as you're thinking about priorities and investments, how can we do this in terms of the protective factors, in terms of the people, and the quality of relationships that make up our programs and services? And then there's one more slide over here that's really busy and has a lot of stuff and examples. But I leave you with two main takeaways, that yes, there's early childhood trauma, and that trauma, for especially for zero to five or early childhood, doesn't happen outside of relationships usually. So thinking about relational healing, that we get hurt in relationships and we heal in relationships and community. So then how do we as stewards of these resources and finances really lift up, scaffold, and fortify that relational medicine network? And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jen. We really appreciate your important words this morning. And they're going to um, highlight some of the work that's being done in our services for children. As well, because there's three uh, programs in Contra Costa County that basically provide the resources that from early childhood mental health program in West County. And basically, we go out into the community and support families about to support those adults who important adults in the child in the child's life to support so some of the programs we have are mental health what they want for their child using natural supports from their life so it could be relatives teachers the people that really matter in pittsburgh we are literally just across the parking lot here um, and so we have a lot of programs that are designed to support kids that are to something, right, to hyper, to aggressive, to defiant, um, so they can come to the therapeutic preschool at the Lynn Center and have a much more positive experience um, and successfully stay there until they can transition to kindergarten. We also have another program um, called New Beginnings, and that is where we have therapists, like Kelly was saying, who provide therapy to kids. Um, in our community, zero to six. So we know sometimes that kids have experienced a lot of trauma and loss and abuse, and they can greatly benefit from play therapy. But we also know that there's some other kids out there that just need a little extra help with social skills, anger management, impulse control, and regulating. Um, so those are all the services that we can support kids with in play therapy. It can be done on site. Um, and like Kelly was saying, we can also go out into the home and sometimes we can go out into the school just depending on what goals have been identified with the family. Uh, another program we have, like Kelly said too, is wraparound. So that's where the family comes together and they identify what goals they wanna work on. And then the wraparound team supports them with that as well. 
Uh, we have a, a program called Child Care, so Child Care Solutions that is for kids who are five and under in some type of a preschool or daycare setting who are struggling, um, who are at risk of being asked to leave that placement. Child, Child Care Solutions can go into that setting, observe the child, support the teacher, support the parent, and hopefully preserve that placement because we know that when kids are asked to leave preschools, they're very smart and they internalize it and they think that they're bad and they think that they've done something wrong. So Child Care Solutions does great work in trying to preserve those placements so our kids can have successful outcomes. Um, another program we have is an um, alcohol and drug program for kids that can actually go up to age 10 where we provide a therapist and the support of a family partner. And then the last program that Lynn Center has is through actually through CalWORKS, and that allows us to support kids who are up to age 17 um, with a therapist and a family partner. Um, so I would just say the very, very bottom line to take away from this is call us, right? And more than likely, we have a, a program that can help and support your child, and if we don't, then we So um, I'm from Early Childhood Mental Health. We're in West County. And we also have all of the same programs uh, that were just talked about. And we've also group for Spanish-speaking mothers. We have a new moms group that's also in English and Spanish. And we have a Muslim moms support group. So we have four doing um, a, a weekly community event where we uh, open up the agency and have different um, directed activities, whether it's movie night or art night. Um, this month is kind of a dance party night, so it's on Tuesday. We're also starting this month, uh, this Wednesday will be our first one. We're doing a drop-in consultation group for preschool teachers. So, so I encourage you to take a look and you know ask us any questions if anything comes up. So thank you. And just really briefly, so we want to help more kids we know that for every child that's important for children, uh, birth to six. So thank you so much. In a few moments, we'll be breaking out into small group discussions, but I wanted to just make a quick announcement because um, I think we have some tables where there's not as many people. So I'm going to ask of your facilitator scribe, uh, if there's two of you, uh, there's not many people. I'm going to have somebody jump into your group to support you. Um, so if you, you have just one person hablar en nuestros grupos pequeños. Gracias. All right, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to, um, in just a minute, we're going to break out for small group discussions, but first I want to introduce this. Um, so just keep in mind, um, as you're participating in the small group discussions, you know, really think about not dominating conversation and creating the space for everybody at your table to participate. Um, and then um, we're going to transition to a slide in just a second um, that is going to have a number of different uh, discussion points um, to help ground the conversation this morning. Um, so it's really a starting place for the discussion, but anyone is free to provide input um, on topics that might not be covered through these points um, in relation to today's forum as well. So um, please feel free to bring in other points that you think are important. Um, so we're going to leave the, um, these discussion points um, up on the screen. Um, each of the tables has uh, a facilitator and a scribe um, wearing these jaunty green uh, ribbons. Um, so they're going to um, introduce you to the small group discussion. We invite you before we uh, do the breakouts, if anybody needs a quick break um, to stretch or refresh your coffee or anything like that, um, now's a good time to quickly get up and do that. And then once everybody's back at your tables, you'll start the discussion. We'll come back together as a group at 1225.
Just wanted to do a quick announcement to um, remind folks you should be seated at your tables at this point for your breakout discussions. So if you haven't gotten a chance to join back in with your group, please make your way to your tables so you can start your small group discussion. We'll also be going around if there are any tables that um, feel a little bit small, we'll figure out consolidation. So we'll talk about that.
All right, everyone, we're going to come back together. So finish your final thoughts. And we're going to do some reporting out and sharing of all of the robust conversation you've all been engaged in. So thank you all so much for coming back together in the room. I'd like to invite, I'd like to invite um, our facilitators, if there are any tables that would like to share one or two thoughts, we have a few minutes to uh, kind of report out to the group at large. So um, maybe it's your facilitator, maybe you have a different representative that you've identified at your group. Um, but if folks um, are able to come forward, as we just have the one mic, um, to uh, share some thoughts that you heard at the table, maybe it's something that was repeated a couple of times. Um, but I'd invite some of the facilitators to come up um, so that they can report out what those thoughts were. Don't be shy. Come on up. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Either or. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, oh. I'm Joe Bruno. I'm one of the resource centers over here representing Delta Peers. Um, I wanted to bring up one major thing that we talked about was uh, when a mother is pregnant and she goes and she's getting uh, paperwork and everything else that to zero health things. What is it like to be a parent and have depression after your child is born? Or what are the resources in that level? So that was one of the discussions that we had on, <clears throat> it's not necessarily a physical thing, you know, it's an, it's an emotional. So having that paperwork handed to them in the same process, um, that was one of the things that we talked about. And then um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was teen moms. We had a discussion about teen moms too, about how they and themselves and their culture and their family, they're probably coming from a parent who was also young. So we have even younger grandmothers that are in this living situation that they need special resources. So that was another conversation that we had was about teen moms. Um, and the big thing on health services and how to, how to establish new programs in a system that is flawed to say the least. Um, so that discussion on health insurance or is it you know, contracting with somebody else? Um, what does that really look like and how to partnership? So those were our discussions today. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, would you like to go next? Sure, try my best. <laughs> um, re regarding reducing stigma, we talked about how you can use the portals of entry being where children and families are already receiving contact with some consistent relationship, which happens to mostly be preschool or schools, because often the doctor's offices, you're seeing different people. If you are using county-based services, you don't have that consistent doctor. So like, where are you gonna share? Where are you gonna slow down and be able to do that? And so the value of perhaps doing more in the school settings for workshops and using the important relationship of the preschool teacher. Um, let's see. And the importance of l reducing the blame factor because, you know, stigma comes with blaming the parent and how, I guess, how you are, how you are in, in relationship when you speak to parents um, and how you help staff speak to parents so that they will talk to you and not feel like they're bad because their kids are having a problem and have to wait for a long time to seek help because they are shy to do so. Um, for the seeking support and training, um, many people talked about the need to have more family partners who are coming from lived experience and having parents understand what's developmentally normal because so many parents have kind of no idea. <laughs> and even if you go to the doctor, uh, you might be seeing about whatever's happening today, but you don't know what six months from now is supposed to look like. And there's such a fast pace of development in early childhood 
having that be kind of more pronounced process and having things like magnets for the fridge or the, there's more interconnectedness between providers so that there's more understanding of what is typically developing and what when you should seek help and involving dads more and having not all the pressure be on moms to pay attention to every detail but the strengths of dads and their involvement in the process um, we talked about how hard it is for people to know where to go for help. These days, things are very um, media-based, and so like you don't really know, like if I could put a question in, where do I get help from my three-year-old in Contra Costa, and then actually have a portal that has a listing of all the services and their eligibility requirements so that it's easier to access. Um, and the last question was, um, trainings. Um, I think one of the important things that was brought up about trainings was the need for cultural training because there's often a lack of understanding about different cultures needs and how they perceive child care and um, growth and development and so that affects what people will share and whether they will um, persist in getting more assistance and one of the last things is how important it is to have aftercare or networks of support for families, whether that's support groups or um, providers being able to transition kids to another service that's needed. Is it, does it even exist? Is there some kind of checking in after? What makes it hard to let go of clients? Thank you, and I'll take <laughs> All right, and we've got uh, time for one or two major takeaways from the rest of our folks. Okay. Um, so I came from table 15 and two things that we discussed was the importance of the MHSA um, separating zero to five from the rest of youth. So currently um, money is allocated from birth to age 25 and how we have the buzzword of early childhood mental health and early childhood education and if how if the MHSA could are all here for today. And the second piece that we talked a lot about at Table 15 was the importance in um, investing in early childhood education because for many of our families in Contra Costa County, their first entry into the system or the education system or how do I seek services for my child is at daycare or preschool. And if we're able to more uh, if we can educate our preschool teachers and our preschool directors on how to give um, our families access to these services, they're the first ones. And so can we give it to them so they can give it to the families? Out of the idea of maybe uh, calling it brain health um, or brain health and development. Um, also, um, we thought of another idea about using an app for new moms, um, inviting them to parenting groups and, um, and information and resources because sometimes it's overwhelming when a, when a mom, a new mom just has a child, uh, getting all those resources and, you know, where she puts those resources, but to, like that reminder uh, app saying, hey, do you need this? Or, um, you know, do you, do you need a parenting group or do you need childcare? So, anyways, those are our ideas. I was at group uh, 14, and we came up with more support while waiting on wait lists. So that would be more support for the parent caregiver uh, to expand services in our county, uh, to start the education process um, par with parents and caregivers before the child is born of what to look for, and also. Um, uh, improving our training um, around implicit bias and racism and assumptions and judgments um, towards parents and caregivers of children with big behavior uh, that um, parents nine times out of ten already walk in with a lot of shame and guilt when you first see them in the first place. Thank you. Okay, I was at table five and we went through a lot, a, a whole lot. And it went over every question, but the first question that started off, it asked about the child, and it gave an age, and then it gave a situation. 
So my question was, well, what was the race of the child? And nobody had that. So how can I work with a child? And I don't know the background, the history, and it doesn't give me anything. So that's the one thing that we talked about is making sure that you know the history and the background of the child and the family instead of walking into the home or to the family and making your assumptions of this is why this child is the way that he is. We talked about training the teachers in all the resources and services. And as everyone talked about, the main things that they talked about is the background history and biases and racism in the workplace before they go out into the schools and work with families because it's more racism in the workplace. And if you don't take care of it then, how can you take care of a family? Reduce the barriers of the services. Appointments. Every appointment and every provider in here works generally nine to five. Most of the families do too. The services that you offer to the families are between nine and five. These families cannot get to those places. They may not have gas. They might not have bus tickets. They may not have services, a way to get from East County to West County to Central. So we gotta figure out a way to make services and appointments where these families can get, it, get to them without being deemed. Expand Medi-Cal instead of being in one county. Mental health is not one county. It's all the counties. And the services that the family may need may not be in the, fam in the county that is needed. Uh, we were talking about as everyone's driving home and everybody's done with everything that they're doing and you're going home and you look across and you see all the uh, billboards, they are filled with tobacco, marijuana, alcohol, and everything else. Most of the families know about marijuana than they know about the services. So why don't we figure a way to put those services on those billboards and those marquees <laughs> than all those things that are taken away from our children. And we talked about a lot. <laughs> and training for families and the providers before the kids go into the schools so they can get to know them and understand instead of a five minute introduction. So they will all get an understanding of each other and see what that person is and if that provider is right for the family instead of being right for the provider. So. Okay, we've got time for one or two more to share. So I was at table 10 and one main point was immigration, that we need better articulation agreements between early childhood services and immigration process, and being able to help individuals fill out forms, helping them to understand mental health services in their languages, and also being able to help them process the difficulty of mental health and the stigma that they might feel, those cultural processes around sensitivities, what does it mean in their culture? Because for a lot of us, um, to even access mental health service, it, it makes us worry that maybe there's something wrong with us. And so, and that isn't the case. So we wanna really be able to look at those articulation agreements between other immigration services and how we might be able to partner better in uh, introducing early childhood education support and social emotional support and mental health. And the other was accessing training, that there's limited time frames in which we can even train staff at a lot of centers because they only have a one hour to 45 minute staff meeting. So it's really important to look at other opportunities to be creative, such as webinars or virtual um, trainings to support them in understanding trauma and early childhood social emotional needs and also overall development. Hello, my name is Marcela and I was in table number one, which is this Spanish speaking table. So um, a few points that um, came up was, first, what can help the stigma around, you know, the Hispanic Latino community and sometimes is um, providers not knowing, you know, much about the cultural or jumping into conclusions, which is linked to also, um, you know, what can help providers, you know, what training they might need. And, you know, that training might be just to be curious about which individual and also, you know, getting in the community and learn a little bit more what is the, you know, that community needs. Um, 
you know, and not necessarily just jumping in, into conclusions or judgment, or also just uh, suggesting that that's the, what the community needs. Um, also, you know, one of the things that come up is, you know, the language barrier. Um, sometimes, you know, when they know where the resources for mental health are, sometimes there's not um, someone that speaks Spanish, for example, um, and sometimes um, it came up that sometimes different parents, you know, don't know where, where uh, the services are for mental health, you know, where to go to access them, which um, brought up some ideas about that they would like to see more advertisement, more, um, you know, noticing, more brochures everywhere, not necessarily like in one spot, but just in the community. I know the previous person that spoke, you know, you know, I totally agree too, and that's what it came out of sometimes. Thank you. Thank you so much to each of you for uh, sharing some um, key takeaways from the group and highlighting some of the needs that we're seeing in the community. Um, I wanted to take one moment just to acknowledge all of the incredible service providers that we have um, literally around the room today um, that um, have tables with lots of information set up. So um, some of you might be sitting um, in the, in the um, circle tables, so feel free to raise your hand or wave as I go around the room if you're not sitting by the table. Um, we've got the County Community Services Bureau. Um, we've got um, Seneca Mobile Response Team and Delta Peers. Um, we've got We Care Services for Children, um, Early Childhood Mental Health Program, COPE Family Support Center, Lynn Center, Coco Kids, First Five Contra Costa, um, Stand for Families Free of Violence has some information in the back, um, uh, NAMI of Contra Costa, and the Contra Costa Crisis Center. So thank you all so much for being here today. So with that, we're gonna learn a little bit more about how to stay involved. Hi, everyone. So um, if you like what's going on here today, uh, Early Childhood Mental Health Community Forum, we have, uh, we have had various other forums this year. Um, to give you an example, uh, previous forums were suicide prevention, uh, immigration, and supportive housing. So uh, we have tried to focus our forums on specific topics that we're hearing from the community and then um, gather some speakers that have um, some experience as well as education and history with um, working with those communities or people that are affected by the various topics we've discussed. And then um, we gather input as well. So this is kind of what we did right here. The small group discussions is also part of what we do and it helps us in preparing for our next uh, three-year plan cycle that's 2020 through 2023. So uh, ways you can stay involved, if you like what's going on here, um, one is you registered in at the table and if you provided an email, you'll probably be putting. Um, we also 